Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Cotton, Director of Tutoring at Prepped and Polish, as well as Senior Tutor. I hope you're all doing well today. I know we are continuing on by staying safe and healthy, hopefully, during this quarantine life. Um, hopefully you have had some time to work on your classes, as well as do a little bit of test prep if you are preparing for either the ACT or SAT. Today we will be talking further about English SAT and ACT grammar rules that you must know. If you were able to catch the other streams, we worked on talking about different aspects of punctuation, grammar, and rhetoric as typically seen on either side of the test, whether it be the ACT or the SAT. Today we're going to continue that. And please feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat feature of the live stream. I'd be happy to answer them. Just be aware there is a slight delay, so if I don't answer it right away, don't worry, I'll get to it. Now today, we're going to be talking more about ACT and SAT grammar rules that you must know. When we talk about the ACT and SAT tests, I always like to reiterate what are these sections on both the ACT and SAT, and how we can best prepare for them. One of the things that if you've seen the past few live streams is that I like to go through and discuss what the differences are between each section, both in the ACT English section as well as the SAT Writing Language section. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, if we look at the ACT English section, that is a 45-minute standard time section with 75 questions over the course of five passages. That comes out to be 15 questions per passage for nine minutes per passage standard time. If any of you out there have extended time or something like that, please feel free to let me know and I'd be happy to discuss what those times look like, both in terms of time and a half and double time. Looking at the SAT section, known as the writing language section, that is a 35 minute section with 44 questions over the course of four passages. That comes out to be 11 questions per passage. And timing is eight minutes and 45 seconds per passage, standard time, or as I like to think about it, eight and a half minutes per passage, because eight minutes and 45 seconds, as you've heard before, it's very challenging to sometimes clock when you're going through the test. Now, once we know, and again, it's important to review these standard time frames and question amount, we can then move on to more content. First off, we will be talking about more punctuation. In this case, the apostrophes, their use, and what I call the big three. Now, when we talk about apostrophes, most students think about two ways we use apostrophes, either to show possession or contraction. For the sake of argument, we're going to be talking about what the ACT and SAT focuses on in terms of apostrophe usage. Specifically, when we talk about apostrophes and using them with possession, that's usually with nouns, because we are trying to express how we have ownership over some thing, which is a noun. This is my easy route to remember this rule of possession with apostrophes. Usually on the ACT or SAT, the test will focus on nouns having possession of either thing, either something, or things. Now, in terms of contractions, now, first of all, my joke is this is not health class, not those types of contractions. However, we are talking about combining a word with a conjugated verb. Typically, that word, uh, in the case here, is a pronoun for the SAT and ACT. So something like IT apostrophe S or T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E. Now in the real world, you can have situations where you could have a combination of either pronoun or noun showing either possession or contraction. The SAT and ACT recognize that. For example, for pronouns, when we show possession, we actually don't use an apostrophe. To show possession, we simply use just a different form. For they, the possessive form is T-H-E-I-R. For its, or for it, apologies, it is I-T-S. Possessive form of you, your. 
However, we don't see too many noun contractions uh, on the test, but it's always good to be aware of that, such as Jake's a jerk. We don't have a conjugated verb, but with the apostrophe S, that suggests that there's a contraction here. So Jake is a jerk, or the dog's running away. The dog is running away. We always got to be careful when we're listening to this to make sure we're not misinterpreting what that apostrophe S is or that we're suggesting that there are multiple dogs or multiple jakes in this case. Now, what are the big three, you might ask? Well, those are periods, semicolons, and comma plus fanboys conjunctions. If you were privy to a previous uh, live stream, I believe it was the first one that I was doing, uh, fanboys is an, uh, a mnemonic device to remember the different types of conjunctions for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Now, the way we always use periods, semicolons, and comma plus fanboys is when we have independent clauses. So number one priority is identifying where the independent clauses are. If we can do that, then we know that any one of these three could be used to separate those two clauses. Now, sometimes we always want to use a period, or sometimes we'll use a, sum, uh, a comma fanboys conjunction, and maybe a few of you feel like very rarely you will ever use a semicolon. However, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what is the best option given? Because the ACT and SAT aren't going to just give you the best one or the one that you would prefer. They're going to give you one that works. Another strategy and rule to remember is to remember what the odd one out is. If we are given answer choices with both period and semicolon and also a comma fanboys conjunction, these are all doing the same thing. So we can't really choose one over the other. Now, before we get into some example problems here, I'm just going to take a quick look at the stream to see if anyone has any questions. Seems like I was a little quiet at the beginning here. Um, just anyone out there, let me know if you can hear me better now. Um, and if you can't, I'm happy to do a little bit of a quick technical difficulty adjustment. Okay, I don't see anyone saying that's still quiet. So let's move on to some examples. Let's talk about possession. Now, in the ACT, you could get a question such as this. Whose car are we taking about, talking about, sorry, for today's discussion? Will it be Dwight's or Jim's car? Now, if any of you watch The Office, you'll know who I'm referring to about Dwight and Jim. But when I look at what is underlined, I see a few things. I see today apostrophe S, today's S apostrophe for answer B, comma after four with today apostrophe s, and then no apostrophe. So I first recognize that today is a noun. So first question is, do I have more than one today or just a singular today? In this case, it's singular. Now that's good. Why, you might ask? Well, I can get rid of both B and D. because Both of these are showing plural days. Now with that in mind, I just have to then look at the difference between A and C. And the only difference is this awkward looking comma after the word for. Now if any of you remember last, uh, the last live stream, I believe, or the stream before that, we talked about comma placement. In this case, a comma after the word for doesn't work. So our answer has to be Let's look at an SAT example. It is important yet annoying to fill out survey questionnaires as they allow a company to understand what each person's thoughts are about the quality of service they experience. Now, specifically focusing on what's underlined, I see person's thoughts. So, we go back to my original question. Do I need a singular person or plural persons? Well, if we're looking at this, we're talking about each persons. 
So that suggests singular. So I can get rid of node change right off the bat. That being said, what are my other choices here? Well, it looks like B, C, and D all have possession going on. Okay, and this is something typically that, uh, typical that occurs with the SAT, where there's not just one instance, but there's multiple instances. So then I look at the word thought. Well, is thought having possession over something? Well, what each person's thoughts are. I don't think it's having possession because what comes after is the verb are. So I don't think possession would work. Therefore, we get rid of be. Now, is it person thought or person's thoughts? Well, are we trying to understand what each person's thought is or each person's thoughts are? Well, we can't change the are in the sentence. So it has to be D. Now, any questions so far, guys? I'm just taking a look at the stream to see if anyone has um, questions about either of these. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. We're gonna move on. Now, let's take a look at some other ways that we can show possession. Now, I spent the whole day looking for a way to get the car into the garage, but its size is too large to fit through the garage doorway. Now, some of you, if you are trying to go off of what sounds right, this is the first hurdle to overcome. Because if I read this, garage, but its size, garage, but its size, garage, but its size, garage, but it is size. Hmm, they all sound the same. So this is what we have to be careful of. First of all, I note that there's an IT apostrophe S, ITS, ITS apostrophe, interesting, or it is. Now here's a little bit of a trick. In this case, IT apostrophe S is showing a contraction for it is which means both A and D are the same answer. Huh, isn't that nice? We just got rid of 50% of our answer choices. But that leaves us with either B or C. Now, here's a little bit of a hint. ITS apostrophe, that is a trap answer. And one thing that we'll be talking about in another stream another day uh, is how ITS apostrophe is not a thing. If I know that, I can get rid of this very common trap answer here and go with the correct answer, B, because ITS is the possessive form of it. So we have to be careful of both how we are supposed to use an apostrophe versus how we're not supposed to use an apostrophe. All right, let's take a look at an SAT example here. It's hard to know what hummingbirds are doing as they swoop through the air, but they're able to beat their wings incredibly quickly as they go from bird feeder to bird feeder. Hmm. So if we look at the underlying portion, but they're able to beat their wings. Well, are we saying they are able to beat their wings? They're possessive able to beat their wings? They are able to beat their wings? Uh, but they are a but they're able to beat their wings. Now each one of these is slightly different. And I realize that I see a little bit of a typo here. But because of what we have here, we are dealing with a contraction because we have they are able to beat their wings. Their T G I R, in this case answer C, the correct answer, has possession. And I almost missed it with no change with T H E R E. That's something we have to be careful of. All right, let's go on to the next, some contractions. And again, this is not health class, people. So don't be thinking about that. This is a different type of contraction. Now, it's been ever so wonderful to see you, but now I must be off on my next adventure. Now, IT apostrophe S means it is, or, here's another one, 
it has. So, it has been ever so wonderful. It's been, it is ever so wonderful. Or it's been. Again, I got to be careful of the apostrophe use with pronouns. Because I have an apostrophe with a pronoun, I-T apostrophe S, it has been the correct answer. Let's look at an SAT example. Ah, this one is always a bit trippy. There is a simple sentence to help remember how to use apostrophes. They're hanging their coats over there. Now, I use this a lot in my sessions with students when I first introduce the concept of apostrophes. And this sentence is a good way to remember it, assuming that you remember how to correctly write it out. Now, if I'm looking at my answer choices here, I have they are hanging their possessive coats over their location. They're possessing hanging their location coats over they are. That is, just sounds wrong. I don't know about you guys. Or B, but not a good answer. They are, good, hanging over their coats, over their possessive. Well, let's see, what does it have possession over? Hmm. And then there, over there, hanging their coats, over there. I see maybe a subject there, but no conjugated verb. That doesn't work. So we're left with only answer choice A. Now, usually when I see contractions and they come up on the ACT or SAT test, I always take into account what's being said previously, as well as almost saying the sentence aloud so I understand it. Because it's very easy sometimes for us to get tripped up in our own minds trying to read this in our heads. All right, now we're going to be talking about the big three. First off, when we're talking about the big three, again, remember periods, semicolons, comma plus fan voids. These are all meant to be used between two independent clauses, which means I need to be able to identify when I have two independent clauses. Let's look at an example. Heath Ledger was a phenomenal actor who played the Joker in The Dark Knight. Unfortunately, he passed away before the film was released. If any of you have seen The Dark Knight, I don't know about you, I find it to be one of the best uh, Batman movies that there has been in quite some time. I don't know about the best superhero movie because whew, there are just so many nowadays, but The Dark Knight was really phenomenal. Now here's the thing. How do I know if I have an independent clause? Well, there's a couple of ways we can do that. First of all, do I have a subject and a conjugated verb? Well, let's look at the first part, before that period. Heath Ledger was a phenomenal actor who played the Joker in The Dark Knight. I have my subject, Heath Ledger. Conjugated verb was, and a phenomenal actor who played the Joker in The Dark Knight. Correct. We have an independent clause. Well, let's look at the next part. Unfortunately, comma, he passed away before the film was released. Now, unfortunately, is our introductory clause here, but I do have a subject, he. I know sometimes people feel like, but Aaron, how are we supposed to know what he is referring to? And it's actually quite easy. You don't need to, because in this context, he is a subject pronoun, which works because we have the word past, which is our verb. Now that I know we have two independent clauses, so look at my answer choices. I have a period, I have a comma, I have a, another comma, or I just get rid of unfortunately and just put a comma. Hmm. Well, interesting thing with B and C. I don't know if any of you remember the live stream about non-essential clauses, but however, surrounded by commas, and also in addition, surrounded by commas, are non-essential transitions, which means none of them work. Because then you have Heath Ledger was a phenomenal actor who played the Joker in The Dark Knight. He passed away before the film was released. That's a run-on sentence, which is not good here. So I can get rid of B and C. Now between A and D, how do I make the choice? 
Well, interesting thing here is that with D, he got rid of the period, as well as unfortunately just put a comma. This is what's known as a comma splice, because you have two independent clauses connected by a comma. That's a big no-no. So it has to be answer choice A. Let's look at an SAT example. It is best to try and avoid driving in the rain whenever possible, but there is an increased chance of hydroplaning on streets and highways if you are not careful enough. I don't know if any of you are old enough to drive yet, but hydroplaning is quite scary. Um, you always want to be careful when driving in the rain. So let's take a look at this. It is best to try and avoid driving in the rain whenever possible. Sounds like a sentence. But there is an increased chance of hydroplaning uh, on streets and highways if you are not careful enough. That is a sentence. But with the use of however. I'm sorry, not however but as a contraster. It seems that, are we trying to draw contrast here? The answer is no. Well, if we get rid of A, we have B, C, and D left. Well, looking at B, semicolon, it's kind of like a period. There are increased chance of hydroplaning. There are an increased chance. I thought it would be there are increased chances, right? Hmm. C has a comma, there is an increased chance. Okay, but that creates two independent clauses with a comma separating them, or combining them. That's another comma splice, can't have that. Which means we have D left, which is our correct answer because a semicolon acts the same way as a period. Now this is a great way to understand a concept in these next set of examples where we have to deal with what is the best option. Before I go, I'm just going to go on to the next part. I just want to check to see our live stream to see if anyone has any questions. <clears throat> Don't see any questions. So let's go on to knowing what is the best option. Again, ideal world, period, separating sentences. That's what we do most of the time. But we don't always get that option. So we have to keep in mind what other choices are there. Now, there are many things that I want to work on over the weekend. In order to get through them all, however, I will need to wake up at 6 a.m. That does not sound like fun, guys. I don't want to wake up at 6 a.m. on the weekend. The weekend is meant to recharge and get some rest. So I can't be waking up at 6 a.m. But if I have chores to do, you have to do your chores. Now, if I'm looking at this, I see a semicolon, sorry, a comma, semicolon, colon, or dash. If you guys were in on the last live stream, you'll remember that colons and dashes are kind of doing the same thing. In which case, neither one of those are correct. Oh, isn't that nice? Again, 50% off. Well, that leaves us with either A or B. Now, again, I could check, do I have two independent clauses? I do. But that comma is not going to work. Again, I'd rather have a period. But in this case, semicolon can do just the same thing. Well, let's take a look at an SAT example. He was born in a small town in southeastern Wisconsin. After, he moved to Minnesota for college. Okay. Now, looks like we have... Two independent clauses. He was born in a small town in southeastern Wisconsin, and after he moved to Minnesota for college. Ooh, actually, that after there is a little bit, I'll say it, awkward. So if I'm looking at that, I don't really want answer choice A, because it, it, it shifts the focus from being an independent clause to being dependent, but I have a period. Hmm. Let's look at our other answer choices. I have comma but, which is kind of like a period. Interesting. I have commas around after. Careful, that would make that non essential suggesting he was born in a small town in southeastern Wisconsin. He moved to Minnesota for college. Whew. That's a lengthy sentence. I don't think that's right. And then we have D. We have our period. Hey, but now we have but after. No, that doesn't work at all. 
because it's doing the same thing with the after comma, which means B has to be our answer. Because if I were to say he was born in a small town in southeastern Wisconsin, but he moved to Minnesota for college, those are two independent clauses separated by a comma fanboys. All right, let's take a look at the last one. Now, this is the odd one out. Now, this is a rule that I sometimes have students remember that if you see a period, a semicolon, a comma fanboys used in exactly the same manner, none of those can be the right answer. It's like saying my answer choice to this problem, answer A is the number two. Answer B is one plus one. Answer C is three minus one. Well, which one is the correct one? None of them, because they're all saying the same thing. So we go with the one that is the odd one out, or one of these things is not like the other. So, although there's plenty of time to read and watch television these days, but it is important to make to take a moment to enjoy the nice weather while also practicing social distancing, of course. Now, if we're looking at this, comma, but, comma, and, semicolon. Aren't those all doing the same thing? They were supposed to use them in between two independent clauses? Well, let's double check. Although there's plenty of time to read and watch television these days, well, that's actually not an independent clause, which means using comma but, comma and, or a semicolon, that just doesn't work. So, odd one out. It has to be D, because that comma connects my dependent clause to my independent clause. Funny how that works out. All right, now, in 2015, Aaron, yes, yours truly, decided to move to Boston, Massachusetts, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he had lived for the past five years. Now, we have an interesting case here. We have Minneapolis, comma, Minnesota, semicolon. Minneapolis, comma, Minnesota, comma, Minneapolis, comma, Minnesota, period, Minneapolis, comma, Minnesota, comma, and where. This is what I was telling you about, guys and gals. We have a semicolon option, a period option, and a comma fanboys. They are all doing the same thing. Now, if you're not careful, you might interpret the commas around Minnesota to suggest that it is non-essential. But in this case, it's not, because that comma is being used to connect Minneapolis, the city, to the state, Minnesota. Which means the comma after Minnesota, the only reason why we have a comma is to connect an independent clause. Aaron decided to move to Boston, Massachusetts from Minneapolis, Minnesota, to a dependent clause, where he had lived for the past five years. So, has to be answer choice B. Now, before we move into the grammar... Uh, does anyone have any questions about either the big three uh, or apostrophes using for either possession or contractions? And again, not health contractions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so we're going to move on. Now, in terms of grammar, talking about modifying clauses here. And if you've ever heard the term a modifying clause or a modified, you might also know it as a describer or description, such as adjectives, or something that not a lot of people will remember, adverbs. But in this case, we're talking about a full-on clause. In this case, there are two types. There are dangling modifiers, which modifies or, as I said, describes the subject of the sentence, and these are typically seen as dependent clauses. They are some kind of introductory clause at the beginning of the sentence, typically. There are times where it could be at the end of the sentence. But usually we see them as introductory clauses. They can be participle phrases, either in the present or the past. And if you don't know what participle phrases are, don't worry. We will talk about that in a, another discussion. Or appositives. These are different types of non-essential or dependent clauses at times. So when we're looking at this, 
I always keep track of when I'm dealing with a dangling modifier. What am I modifying after? It's usually the subject or something similar. Now, the other type of modifying clause is a misplaced modifier, and they are uh, misplaced. Who would have thought that? Um, now, usually you can find this uh, found throughout the text. It's not limited to just the beginning. It could be within a sentence. It could be at the end of a sentence. It could be at the beginning of a sentence. But usually we don't always notice them right away because, well, our brain is just too smart. Um, typically, we read over them without realizing that they are incorrect. Um, and our brain kind of fixes the sentence uh, when you read it. So usually when I see these guys come up, it's I see the same sentence stated again and again, but the words are being flip-flopped, moved around, shifted over, put here, then put there. So if I see that happening, I probably am dealing with a modifying clause, specifically a misplaced modifier. Let's take a look at some examples specifically dangling modifiers. Now, knowing that it was not going to end well, the dog ran directly into the glass door, and I laughed out loud. That doesn't sound fun, but, you know, hopefully the dog is okay. Now, if I take a look at that answer, the dog ran directly into the glass door, and I laughed out loud. I don't really see anything wrong with it. I laughed out loud as the dog ran directly into the glass door. Mm, that also sounds right. Laughing out loud as the dog ran directly into the glass door. That could work. Or the dog ran directly into the glass door while I laughed out loud. Mm, all these seem to sound the same. Different constructions, yes, but like they all sound the same. So how do I make the choice? Well, look at the beginning, knowing that it was not going to end well. Who or what is knowing that it's not going to end well? Well, based on no change, it suggests that the dog knew it was not going to end well. Why would the dog run directly into the glass door then? B suggests that I knew it was not going to end well, and I laughed out loud as the dog ran directly into the glass door. C suggests that laughing out loud knew it was not going to end well. well that doesn't make sense. And again, D suggests the dog knew it wasn't going to end well. This is how I approach these questions. I ask myself, well, who is or what is knowing that it's not going to end well? In this case, I know it is I. So it has to be answer choice B. Let's look at another example from the SAT. Uh, the night was dark, stormy, and full of wandering animals. Since he had done so well in his driving test, Jacob was able to avoid the animal on the road and safely park the car. We have, since he had done so well in his driving test, there were several small creatures on the road. He was, oh, he had done well on his driving test, and he did well on all driving tests and behind-the-wheel exercises. Hmm. That seems off. Because D and C seem to be saying the same thing. As well as A. That will lead some people to think, oh, there were several small creatures on the road. Comma. Wait a second. Isn't that a sentence? Which means what comes after should be dependent. But Jacob was able to avoid the animal on the road and safely park the car. That doesn't make sense, grammatically. But if we look at answer choice A, which is the correct answer here, it's suggesting that since he had done so well, who? Well, Jacob. Jacob was able to avoid the animal on the road and safely park the car. That is what the correct answer is, because we are describing Jacob by saying he did so well on his driving test. Let's look at some other examples for modifying by uh, dangling modifiers. Now, while looking for a home to move into, cockroaches are nearly impossible to get rid of unless you are an exterminator or have roach spray. Oof, that does not sound good. But while looking for a home to move into, you can find them in the most derelict of homes, found in only the most derelict of homes, or unless you know where to look. Hmm. Well, what immediately comes after this clause? Cockroaches. 
So are cockroaches looking for a home to move into? I mean, maybe, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, you can find them in almost in the most derelict of homes. Well, that sounds like a sentence. It doesn't make sense then to have cockroaches are nearly impossible to get rid of. Found in only the most derelict of homes. What is found? Ah, here we go. Cockroaches are found in the most derelict of homes. Answer choice C. Let's look at an SAT example. Now, hardworking and dedicated, the officer was able to establish himself within the community as an able-bodied champion for justice. Okay. Establishing himself within the community was as an able-bodied champion for justice was the officer. The community had an able-bodied champion for justice who was an officer. The officer's goal was to establish himself within the community as an able-bodied champion for justice. Again, I'm seeing the same words, but different formats. So I look at the beginning of the clause. Hardworking, dedicated. Who or what was hardworking and dedicated? Well, the police officer. Now, in this case, if I'm looking at this, the only choice that talks about the officer, be careful now, is answer choice A. D does talk about the officer, but more about the officer's goal. Now, was the officer's goal hardworking and dedicated? Not so much. It is the officer, him or herself. Um, now, let's take a look at some misplaced modifiers. Now, Jack Johnson is one of my favorite musicians from Hawaii that has been around since the early 2000s. Now, when reading this, you might not see anything wrong. But what this is suggesting is that Jack Johnson is one of my favorite musicians from Hawaii. Hawaii that has been around since the early 2000s. Now, Hawaii and I believe Alaska were two of the last states to join the United States. But it definitely was not in the 2000s. So because of that, I can't go with A. Let's look at the other answer choices. Jack Johnson is one of my favorite musicians that has been around since the early 2000s from Hawaii. Okay, one of my favorite musicians from the early 2000s, Jack Johnson was born in Hawaii. Okay, Jack Johnson, born in Hawaii, is one of my favorite musicians since around the early 2000s. Hmm. Now, if we're looking at these answers here, I'm wary of answer choice B, mainly because you have the situation where early 2000s from Hawaii. Is early 2000s from Hawaii? I don't think so. But then we are stuck between C and D. Now, I go with answer choice C because one of my favorite musicians from the early 2000s, who, Jack Johnson, was born in Hawaii. With D, Jack Johnson, born in Hawaii, is one of my favorite musicians since around the early 2000s. It gets a little bit wordy. So sometimes you can even have a little bit of rhetoric mixed in with some of these modifiers. All right, let's take a look at an example from the SAT. Donald Glover, who is a well-known actor on both the small and big screen, originally had several popular YouTube videos when he was younger. Originally had several popular YouTube videos when he was younger. When he was younger, YouTube videos that were extremely popular. Originally had several popular videos when he was younger on YouTube. Or had several originally popular YouTube videos when he was younger. Now, when we're trying to put together the correct formation here, we have to look at what words are in which place. Because... Did he originally have or had several popular YouTube videos? Or was it originally had several popular YouTube popular videos when he was younger on YouTube? Or had several originally popular YouTube videos? Now, as I work through this sentence, again, I'm asking myself, what is the correct formation here? And it might take a little bit of work to eliminate some of them. 
First of all, I would have gotten rid of B. B just seems a little bit awkward when he was younger YouTube videos that were extremely popular. Then between A, C, and D, I would work off of what are we trying to say? He had popular videos on YouTube when he was younger. So A is the best option because we're trying to talk about he had these YouTube videos when he was younger, not he had videos when he was younger on YouTube. It's more about where the videos are or coming from. So that's how we work through this one. Now, let's look at a few more examples. The expeditions of dangerous ancient civilizations uh, allowed viewers the opportunity to explore historically significant practices and cultures. Okay, so we have historically significant practices and cultures, significant historically practices and cultures, significant practices and historical cultures, or cultures that are historically significant with practices. Those are some wordy, wordy answers. But how do I get rid of some of them? Well, significant historically practices. Now, here's a little bit of a hint. Historically is an adverb. Adverbs, for all intents and purposes, do not modify nouns, such as practices. Because of that, get rid of it. Now, significant practices and historical cultures. Okay. Cultures that are historically significant, okay, with practices. Are we talking about historically significant cultures and with those practices? Or are we talking about two different things? And that's our hint. Because we're talking about historically significant practices and cultures. Significant practices and historical cultures suggests that we only care about the significant practices and historical cultures. But it's historically significant because these are ancient civilizations. Let's look at one more. Though most households did not have them 50 years ago, home security systems are now available to many people that are inexpensive. Wait, are the people inexpensive here? <laughs> no, that sounds silly. Um, but today, comma, home security systems are available to many that are inexpensive. Home security is seen as both an inexpensive and widely available for those who own homes. Oof. Or home security systems are inexpensive and available to many people. Well, we're talking about the home security system, right? Which, that's our dangling modifier at the beginning. But almost all these, save for B, expresses that we're talking about home security. So I get rid of B. Okay. And I already said that A sounded off. So we get rid of those two. We're stuck between C and D. Personally, and for the ACT, SAT, C is way too wordy. So it has to be answer choice D. And we're talking about how home security systems are inexpensive and available to many people. Those are the two things. Okay. Now, I'm going to take a look at our... Uh, our live stream uh, chat to see if anyone has any questions. Looks like we had someone come in and then leave. Hopefully, uh, Lori, you had a pleasant experience here for all of, oh, it looks about a minute. Um, but guys, if you ever want to take a look back at any of these videos, remember, you can check out our YouTube channel. You can also uh, reach out to us if you have any questions about test prep, and we'd be happy to help you with um, any of your concerns or areas needing focus. Now, let's take a look at the last part of today's lesson. Rhetoric, sentence and paragraph order. Now, just a heads up, guys. These sentences and paragraphs, they're not fun when you see them come up on the test. However, you're going to see them come up on the test. So you want to be prepared for them. So what are they? Well, they're asking you how to deal with the sentence or the structure, sorry, of a passage. Um... Usually you get some kind of heads up at the beginning of the passage or the paragraph, usually bracketed numbers or box numbers or some little note that says, hey, just so you're aware, the paragraph may not be in the correct order. Oh, thank you for that. Um, and speaking of order, it matters. So what does it mean to start with 
or start or end with something. That's where we talk about the flow of the passage or the paragraph. We need to make sure we have a logical setup from the beginning to the middle to the end. So if we look first at sentence order, this is what I call the micro or the small part, you know, zooming in, so to speak. We have to pay attention to what is being talked about in the paragraph. And I always ask myself, do the sentences connect? Does sentence one connect to sentence two, connect to sentence three? Does sentence two interrupt the discussion between sentence one and sentence three? So on and so forth. Then we move out or zoom out. Uh, to the macro, aka the paragraph order. Now this is where we have a little bit more of a challenge because we have to pay attention to what the passage is talking about as a whole. And what I usually go to if I have to quickly get through this is what is the main idea or do the main ideas of each paragraph fit together going from paragraph one to two to three. And finally, uh, one more type of question that sometimes crops up is sometimes sentence and or word placement. So you're given a sentence and or word, and you're trying to figure out where should it go. This is all based off of context clues, and we got to be careful of that. Now, let's take a look at some examples. Sentence order. All right. I was so excited I could barely pack. That all changed the summer after my sophomore year of high school. My dad announced that we were going to Singapore for vacation. Today, I have been all over the world, but until I was 15, I had never left the United States. Now, if you guys are reading along, you'll realize that just sounds confusing. Where are we going with this? And this question, what is the most logical order for these sentences? We're trying to figure out what is that order. Now, quick strategy here, guys. Look at answer A and answer B. They both have sentence one, as the beginning of this paragraph. Well, does it make sense to have sentence one at the beginning of the paragraph? If I say yes, I get rid of C and D and I go on to the next sentence. If I say no, I get rid of A and B and I take a look at C and D. Now in this case, C and D, sentence four, that does sound like a great starting point because then we can go into the content about packing summer uh, after sophomore year and going to Singapore for vacation. But here's the thing. It doesn't make sense to say today I've been all over the world, but until I was 15, I had never left the United States. I was so excited I could barely pack. That all changed the summer after my sophomore year of high school. Hmm. No, that does not work. Quite honestly, looking at my answer choices here, I only have a few to choose between, either having sentence two come after sentence four or sentence three coming after sentence four. In this case, sentence two makes the most sense because you said, until I was 15, then summer after my sophomore year of high school. That would make sense in a chronological order. So we gotta be careful of those. Let's look at another example. Whew, after a year of living on futons and eating ramen, the founders of Hourglass decided that antique watches weren't profitable enough to sustain a business. Instead, they decided to invest in modern designs, create new watches, and market them at a discount online. Hourglass soon skyrocketed to success. Within a year, it broke $10 million in revenue and announced its intent to expand overseas. A lot of existing watch companies are now looking to buy out this company that was once on the verge of of bankruptcy. With those plans in place, the company began to attract the young and fashionable crowd, as well as celebrities looking for the next trend. It's a lot of sentences. But now we ask, where should sentence six be placed? Well, what is sentence six talking about? With those plans in place, right, the company began to attract young and fashionable crowd, as well as celebrities for the, looking for the next trend. Well, does that make sense to go after sentence one? Does it make sense to go after sentence two? Does it make sense to go after sentence four? We have to be careful where we place it, because sometimes, if we're not careful, we might think it's good right where it is. But in this case, sentence two says, instead, of, instead they decide to invest modern designs, create new watches, and market them at a discount online. 
Those are the plans that they're talking about. So that's why it should go after sentence two. Now, paragraph order. You guys are almost there. Don't worry, we're just about done. This one is going to just take a bit of time. We got a lot of paragraphs. So, as part of a new program, our state decided to give first-time offenders the choice of a three-day hike through the mountains or a month of detention. Because my partner Fred and I guided hiking tours through the mountains, we were chosen to be the tour guides for this program. Three days in the wilderness with five juvenile delinquents was not exactly what we had in mind when we started our hiking business. Then again, how hard could it be? Paragraph two, the answer came quick, quite quickly during our first during the first hike. It was clear these kids, Tony, Lisa, Scott, Sarah, Tim, did not want to be there. They grudgingly made their way through the trails, throwing rocks and breaking branches. The pace could not have been slower. After many hours of whining and complaining about being tired and hungry, the first day finally came to an end. Fred went up first to make sure none of the carabiners had come loose or overly worn under the weather. Scott couldn't wait to harness up and start the climb. The others weren't so enthusiastic. I told them we could make the two-day hike back the way we came or climb up and be at the clubhouse within a few hours. Before we knew it, we were celebrating at the clubhouse. Over the course of the next day, their attitudes started to change. Whoa. Or weren't we at the clubhouse? Hmm. With each step, the children began to realize that their lives were in our hands. After all, they would have to rely on us for help if they got lost or fell. They had to either listen or risk serious injury. Toward the end of the hike, we, present them, we presented the final challenge, the wall. There were other paths we could have taken, but we like to challenge our guests with a little mountain climbing. The cliff is not only 12 feet high, is not is only sorry 12 feet high so even an inexperienced climber can easily reach the top okay a few months later okay i asked the kids to see if our little hiking trip in the mountains had changed anything i was pleased to hear that no one had been in trouble since can't wait to take on the next batch so by reading all this guys and i apologize for the length of it something is off Something doesn't quite fit. So, for the sake of logic and cohesion, paragraph three should be placed. Now, I'm going to flip back here. Paragraph three is the one where Fred went up first. Now, if I'm trying to figure out where it should be placed, where it is now after paragraph four, before paragraph one, or after paragraph five, I sometimes like to do a little bit of a recap on the paragraphs. Now, paragraph three is all about Fred, Scott, Sarah, and Tim. Uh, attempt the wall and what they're doing. Now, if it is here, does it make sense to go after paragraph two, which is talking about the first hike, and before paragraph four, day after the start to the first, the final challenge? Hmm. But we haven't, if we're introducing the final challenge in paragraph four, does it make sense to talk about it before then? I don't think so. Or after paragraph four, before paragraph five. Well, paragraph five is talking about months after the hike. Okay. Before paragraph one, as an introduction. Well, paragraph one is talking about the wilderness hikes and juvenile delinquents, starting it off. We're, we can't suddenly start talking about Fred, Scott, Sarah, and Tim. Or does it make sense to be at the end, after paragraph five, as a conclusion? Does this work as an ending? Well, no, because the paragraph five is the ending. So that means our answer is B. Now, these guys, trust me, they take a while to get through. Thankfully, if anything, you're only going to experience them one per test, or one, not one per test, my apologies, one per passage. On the ACT, there are five passages. On the SAT, there are four. So at most, five of these questions or four. The likelihood of seeing them at the end of every single passage, probably not going to happen. Now, let's look at the last example here before we wrap up today's live stream. Sentence and word placement. Now, subsequent deployment of remote listening devices and motion sensing cameras finally gave scientists the evidence they needed to confirm the existence of the bird. So then in 2004, a large woodpecker was videotaped. Its wings, flight, and plumage 
were cited as evidence that the bird was indeed an ivory-billed woodpecker. Furthermore, the Arkansas researchers noted evidence of active woodpeckers in markings on trees, and they also documented several bird sightings. Fearing bird watchers flooding, further searches were conducted in secret, as was the rush by privately funded Nature Conservancy to purchase potential woodpecker habitat in the Arkansas wilderness. Now, whew, big paragraph. But now we're trying to improve the cohesion flow of the paragraph. I want to add in this sentence. Approximately 15 sightings were reported in early 2004, all possibly of the same bird. So we have to figure out where this sentence would most logically be placed. Well, we talk about 2004 in sentence one at the beginning. So it doesn't make sense to go before sentence one. Before sentence two, well, its wings, flight, and plumage were cited as evidence. Was that before the signs were reported? After sentence two, before saying furthermore, the Arkansas researchers noted evidence of active woodpeckers in markings on trees, and they also documented several bird sightings. Oh, wait, they documented several bird sightings? Interesting. Because that would make sense if we placed it after sentence three. Because now we're talking about those sightings. And guess what? After sentence three is the correct answer. Now, guys, gals, I'm going to take a quick look to see if you have any questions about this live stream. I know we're cutting it a little close to one o'clock. I really appreciate you guys sticking it out. And keep in mind that if you enjoyed today's grammar lecture, please join us on our next segment for more SAT and ACT tips, tricks, and strategies. The time and day of the next one is to be determined right now. But if you be sure to click the subscribe and bell notification, uh, that'll help you find out the time and date of our next scheduled prepped and polished live stream. And if you are looking for more individualized help, please feel free to contact us for one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. You can check out our website at www.preppedandpolished.com or call us at 781-753-9951. And please feel free to check out our Prepped and Polished podcast. Uh, we've had a few in the past couple weeks talking about different ACT and SAT strategies. So I'd be happy to connect with you guys and you know, help you out with your test prep needs. As I said, guys, please stay healthy, stay safe. I hope you enjoy, to enjoy today's live stream. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. And we, I look forward to working with you guys again on more ACT and SAT strategies, tips, tricks. Have a great and wonderful day.